Hey everyone, I am back! For this video, anyway. Um, I should really address this huge absence of mine that I have taken, like, what, a year and a half long break? Um, just me being fully transparent, that is due to my utter and complete laziness. Well, also personal stuff that I won't bore you guys with, but also, yeah, legitimately laziness and also... Uh, what free time I have, I've been using for various other things. I've been uh, reading a buttload of comics, um, getting into a bunch of TV shows, uh, a bunch of movies, both superhero and not. And videos, like writing and making videos, has taken a backseat to all that. So I apologize, and I've received a few comments here and there that have been wondering, you know, when I'm going to do more videos. And I really appreciate the interest, I really do. Um, but, you know, uh, with all that free time I was using for other things and my, uh, you know, like writing inspiration I've been using for school and other personal things like that, um, you know, my videos probably wouldn't have come out any good if I've been doing them during that time. So uh, that's all to say that uh, I am no less enthusiastic about reviewing things like Batman episodes or other movies or even comics. Um, so hopefully I will get back into it more and videos will come out more regularly. But I'm not promising anything because again, when I promise things, I take a huge ass break. So that's all to say that hopefully more videos will be coming soon. I thank all of you for your interest and for keeping the subscriber count up and everything. So without further ado, let's move on to the review you clicked on. Take care everyone. See you soon. I'm in deep trouble. I have the unenviable task of reviewing The Amazing Spider-Man 2. If they're not already annoyed with my hyperbole, some viewers may be thinking, Yep, you have to watch this lackluster movie. Best of luck to ya. It may surprise those viewers to know that the difficult part of reviewing this particular piece is articulating exactly why I'm in the minority opinion. I really enjoy this film. It checks the marks for a lot of what I want in a Spider-Man movie, yet I have to acknowledge that it's been critically panned for the most part, and not without valid reason. I don't want this review to be only me defending this film from the most popular critiques fans have made, but I have to do some of that in order to examine what works within the story and where other critics are spot on. Before I continue, I'm throwing out the spoiler warning, because like I said in my previous review, I'll be analyzing the story as a whole and its various plot elements, including the ending. If you want to watch this review, I strongly recommend having seen The Amazing Spider-Man 2 beforehand. Immediately, this film is more difficult to discuss, at least in the more linear fashion I'm accustomed to, because there's a lot going on here. The mystery behind Peter's parents, the romance with Gwen, developing the two central antagonists of Electro and Harry Osborn, and covering thematic ground in relation to Peter's constant journey to come of age, and that's not even including the huge amount of setup for a future Sinister Six film that probably won't happen anytime soon. Already, this is the first major criticism lobbed against The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It has way too many subplots to be a truly cohesive story. And I agree. I get the sense that like the first film, there were many scenes left on the cutting room floor, whether it be at the script stage or editing room. Examples of this would be clips seen in a trailer where Harry reveals that Oscorp has had Peter under surveillance, and a deleted scene in the special features that reveals that Richard Parker survived the opening plane crash sequence, which I want to be sure to discuss later on. It's a wonder then that the film still feels overstuffed with plot and lands at a decent 2 hour 20 minute mark. Perhaps all those elements I pointed out could work very well in a single film. After all, other superhero films, with Civil War being the most recent example, have successfully juggled plots with a wide assortment of characters, so it could be that the sense of too much going on in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is merely a symptom of incorrect priorities. Electro, for instance, isn't a complex enough character to warrant the amount of screen time he gets. A popular complaint thrown out against him specifically is that at first he idolizes Spider-Man and then has a light switch turn where he irrationally thinks Spider-Man has betrayed him and goes full on supervillain. I had no problem believing that Electro would turn at the drop of a hat because the scenes that set him up already portrayed him as a borderline maniac, especially when he imagines himself attacking Smythe for insulting Spider-Man, 
But therein lies the problem. From the beginning, he's a two-dimensional cartoon character that doesn't do much to challenge Peter beyond the physical. Yet he has substantial setup and gets roped into a traditional supervillain team-up, a la Spider-Man 3. Which the thought of already puts a bad taste in moviegoers' mouths, and mine as well. With that said, I can at least give Electro some credit for serving a thematic purpose. He's that holdover from the thread begun in the first film with Dr. Connors working for Oscorp. As an organization, Oscorp wields much power with their technological and scientific achievements, but its patriarch, Norman Osborn, only cares about the bottom line, in this case the pursuit of more power and a cure for his affliction, so the institution does not use that power responsibly, evident in how Connors and Max Dillon are treated. Connors is forced to conduct human testing prematurely, and Max is not given the proper recognition for designing the company's electric grid, which serves as the location for the climactic electro fight. By treating its employees as a means to an end, Oscar corrupts everyone it touches, turning many into cutthroat and uncaring workers as demonstrated by how Smythe treats Max, and by the board of directors trying to oust Harry from his inherited position of CEO. If they don't become corporate weasels, they turn into genetic freaks that wreak havoc on the city in their colorful new supervillain guise. Harry himself says that the Oscorp way is to get rid of anything inconvenient to the board. This makes Oscorp, on a conceptual level, a very good antithesis for everything Spider-Man stands for, and sets up a logical progression for Spider-Man facing his greatest challenge in the future at the hands of Oscorp with the Sinister Six. By the way, props for pulling Donald Menken from the comics and having him be the head of the Oscorp board. The one aspect of Electro that I think is developed enough to find him at least slightly relatable is how his difficulty with his social interaction and timidity makes him a very easy target to be taken advantage of, which I find pretty indicative of real-life workplace situations. You aren't going to get very far in much of any career if you can't work with people. This sort of makes him a very, very extreme version of how Peter was like at the beginning of the first film, and how socially distant he was, and the awkwardness he displayed when asking Gwen on a date for the first time. Even though Electro is one of those elements that bogs the film down with too much plot, I have a very difficult time saying exactly what should be cut out for two reasons. One, Jamie Foxx seems to be having a blast playing this very cartoonish cardboard cut out of a character, so I can't help but have fun along with him, which is a testament to his acting ability that he was able to engage me into this character despite how mediocre he's written. Second, Electro looks fantastic and seems to provide the film with endless possibilities for really cool action sequences and shots. Logically, I know the film should focus less on Electro to streamline the plot and focus more on the elements that actually do work, but I'll be damned if I wasn't squealing like a little kid while he and Spidey duked it out in Times Square or in the power grid. Even though I compared the supervillain team up to Spider-Man 3, there was at least an effort to make this plot point make some sense by having Harry appeal to Max's inferiority complex when he tells Max he needs him. The real problem I have with the team-up is that it squanders a potentially interesting opportunity to explore these pair of villains with our pair of heroes. Throughout both of these films, though especially this one by the end, we are shown how Peter and Gwen work well together, that they in essence need each other. Much of what's interesting about Peter's development in this film is how he copes with the complexities of having Gwen around and her being gone. The villains could have been used to further explore or contrast this theme by showing Max and Harry interact more, perhaps even double-cross one another to show the dark side of needing another person, or simply using them as a means to an end like Oscorp. As it stands, that line Harry has ends up being a simple and quick excuse to join forces. Now, I'd like to move away from Electro and discuss Harry on his own. Out of the two, I find him much more interesting, but his turn into the Green Goblin is just as problematic, if not more so. For the sake of the story, Harry really needed to be set up in the first film, because it gives this one the added headache of having to convince the audience of Peter and Harry's friendship, along with everything else this story is dealing with. To Amazing Spider-Man 2's credit, great performances save the day again, because I really love Dane DeHaan as Harry, and he interacts extremely well in the scenes with Garfield, especially when Peter gets him to open up and smile after his father's death. I can't exactly recall right now, but someone in the special features, it may have been Ortsy or Kurtzman or Webb himself, says that with Harry, they wanted to do a slow burn goblin movie, which sounds like a great idea to me. To see Harry slowly but surely decay and get pushed to the point of desperation to become Spider-Man's big antagonist could work great for a Spider-Man movie. But in order to do this effectively, this film needed to be extremely streamlined to really get the full impact of Harry's turn to the dark side. With the other primary villain and the subplots concerning Peter's parents, Harry's arc becomes diminished. 
All these elements are at least flimsily connected, but focusing on one or two of them would have worked better than having them all at once. That, by the way, is another structural weakness of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. It is pretty convenient, or especially inconvenient as it were for Peter, that the death of Norman Osborn slash Harry's arrival and Max's transformation happen pretty much at the same time, making Harry and Max's roles in the story feel too disparate from each other. Some of the film's plot progression could have probably been helped if somehow one of these elements was the cause of the other. But getting back to Harry, what really boggles my mind is why he's so desperate to be cured immediately. After all, Norman seemed to live well past middle age, and Harry has all the same resources at his disposal, so why can't he wait for Spider-Man to run tests on Harry's blood before giving him a sample? There's not even an attempt at a contrivance to make Harry's irrational fear work, which is a real shame because, like I said, Dahan is really selling Harry's downward spiral, releasing more and more of that anger that is clearly just below the surface after Norman's death. I say after Norman dies because Harry's anger is just right there on the surface during the deathbed scene, albeit not as maniacal as when he goes goblin at the end. If Harry's progression was more thought out and given proper focus, he could have easily been one of the best tragic villains in a superhero film. Speaking of Goblin, it really is a testament to this film's wonky pacing that even though Harry is given his own subplot throughout, Goblin still feels tacked on at the end. It's as if the film should be over, at least in a structural sense, after Electro is defeated, and yet Goblin needs to be crammed in for a few minutes so they can rush Death of Gwen Stacy and guarantee the film is as overstuffed as humanly possible. I don't think Electro as is could carry an entire film, but having him be the only true villain for this film, turning Harry into the Goblin at the very end, and saving Death of Gwen Stacy for a third film would have been a much better idea for the story being told here. Well, now that we're talking about things that should be in other movies, let's go to my least favorite plotline in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, the Richard Parker Conspiracy. After rewatching this movie a few times, I've become convinced that the plane crash scene and Peter finding the video where Richard explains that he implanted his own DNA into the spiders should have been in the first Amazing Spider-Man, especially with the Mark Webb idea that I mentioned in the last review of that film being about a boy finding his father only to find himself. Since the last movie was heavily marketed as the untold story, I think fans and moviegoers would have been much less disappointed in that regard if the revelations arbitrarily saved for the sequel were given to us up front. I suppose the problem with this is that by excising most of Richard's subplots, you can also take away Aunt May's already small role, and it would be a shame to lose the great scene where she breaks down to Peter and asserts that she is his real mother figure, like Ben is his real father figure. You could also make the argument that Richard is at least somewhat tied thematically to this movie because the passage of time is an important motif throughout, and Richard's time with his family being up adds to the fleeting happiness Peter experiences with Gwen in the present. The film even begins by showing us the inner workings of Richard's watch. But a short flashback of the Parkers being happy together before the plane crash, as the film begins, would have served just as well. You could even keep the opening shot of the watch to drive the motif home and preserve the symmetry of the final battle taking place in the clock tower. Now that I think about it, perhaps the other thematic justification for the Richard subplot is that he plays into the idea of Spider-Man giving people hope, possibly even a cruel false hope, because Richard reassures his wife that everything is going to be alright just before they're killed in the plane crash. Which is bafflingly edited, I might add. Seriously, we are shown the Oscorp assassin hitting Richard in the face, and then the pilot, who hasn't been in a single frame yet, inexplicably loses consciousness. We don't see a bullet ricochet and hit the pilot or anything. Also, maybe I'm missing a plot detail, but I have no idea why Richard makes accessing the Roosevelt video so needlessly complicated. Since Peter is the only one that can continue Richard's research, why not just give Peter everything he needs in the secret briefcase instead of leaving behind really cryptic clues like the subway coins? He must have intended for Peter or someone to find that video, right? Otherwise, why sacrifice yourself to upload the video file during a plane crash? By the way, even though I can buy you have a secret lab to work on his experiments so Oscorp can't get their hands on them, it's still pretty over the top to me to have it in a secret subway tunnel behind a fake wall that's activated with the coins. All this makes me even more glad that the scene with Richard and Peter after Gwen's death was cut. First of all, it would have raised way too many questions and tacked on even more plot after Goblin. Second, it would diminish Uncle Ben's impact on Peter's development in the first film because he would no longer be the primary paternal influence in Peter's life now that Richard is around to give him the responsibility credo. Third, it would have served little purpose anyway since Gwen's graduation speech, which I'll get back to later, 
it is already there as justification for Peter to be Spider-Man again, and the focus should definitely be all about Gwen in the finale. Well, after all this complaining, and I'm not quite done yet, you may have forgotten that I started this review by saying, I like this movie. Aside from the stellar performances across the board, Peter slash Spider-Man and Gwen make it very easy for me to swallow an admittedly overabundance of flaws. The combination of both Amazing Spider-Man films forces me to seriously put Gwen under consideration for the best female character in a superhero movie, not only because she's very charming, but she's every bit the hero Spider-Man is. Not only does she demonstrate that she is smarter than Peter by thinking to magnetize the web shooters to fight Electro, but she also risks her life to defeat the villain. In both movies, actually. I do like that her smarts are not portrayed in a condescending manner to Peter, but she's still able to crack a joke about it when she points out that Peter was still number two at Midtown High. Now, before delving deeper into Gwen's role, I should point out that not even her relationship with Peter is without flaw in the writing department, though the problem is more with Peter than anything she does. I know Peter has been racked with guilt in between this film and the previous one due to breaking his promise to Captain Stacy, which is really awkward with Amazing Spider-Man's ending, but Peter being wishy-washy and turning the relationship into an on-again, off-again deal doesn't add much of anything except easy drama. By the way, Peter stalking Gwen around every day certainly doesn't help in the endearing boyfriend department, which she seems to be really okay with. It's lucky that Garfield and Stone have such great chemistry or else these things would never cease to bother me on rewatch. Gwen moving to England and Peter deciding what the best thing to do for both of them could have probably been enough to sustain a romantic subplot. Also, I don't mind Peter seeing the ghost of Captain Stacy because I get what they're going for in that Peter's not going insane or anything, but that it's simply a visual representation that he is reminded of Captain Stacy in key moments. My favorite being when everything goes into slow motion as Electro is about to attack towards the end. Seeing Captain Stacy in this brief moment is good foreshadowing that Peter will have even more guilt to deal with when history repeats itself with Gwen, especially now that she's run off and put herself at risk to stop Electro. Her death due to getting involved in superheroics unexpectedly doesn't throw her under the bus, because I don't get the sense that she died out of recklessness on her or really Peter's part. She was the only one in the moment that could help Spider-Man, and she had the brains to pull it off. Gwen took the initiative to be a hero because it was the right thing to do, and she genuinely believed that she could help, which she did since Spider-Man couldn't have saved the day without her. It's from this that the viewer truly gets why Gwen and Spider-Man are a great duo. Aside from showing us that they have the teamwork down, she also lives by the great responsibility credo. It's just that Gwen never articulates it in that manner. She does exactly what Uncle Ben told Peter in the first movie. She felt she could do something good for other people, and she took it upon herself as a moral obligation to help however she could. When she asserts that helping out is her decision, I interpret her intensity in that moment as her being so committed to saving lives that for her, there is no choice. Fulfilling her responsibility is something that she needs to do. The fact that she dies illustrates that being a hero comes with a price, both for herself and one that Spider-Man will have to continually deal with. In many respects, Gwen is at the thematic center of the film, which, despite the rushed events that lead to this, makes it a very appropriate place to kill her off. She makes the time and hope theme Spider-Man is grappling with poignant, because the example she set by being a hero gives Peter hope in the same way he hopes the Spider-Man persona will be able to for others. I really like her graduation speech, which serves to book in the film because, at least in my eyes, it's able to get away with spelling out the film's message. Everything she mentions in the speech is a wonderful combination of her own principles, a message appropriate for her fellow high school graduates, and the universal themes Spider-Man stories always play with. For instance, her assertion, fight for what you think is right, and even if we fail, what better way is there to live, is her version of the great responsibility message, and alludes to how Spider-Man is on this constant quest to atone for not saving Uncle Ben, and perseveres even when he makes mistakes. The only real problem with having this speech at the end is that it's almost a carbon copy of the ending of the first film, where Uncle Ben leaves behind a stirring phone message as Peter reflects upon the journey the film has taken him on. On the whole, the posthumous message device is more natural and emotional in relation to this film's themes over the previous one. Interestingly, the half of the speech we see at the beginning centers around the passage of time, while the half at the end deals with hope, and both effectively sum up who Spider-Man is, why he's a hero, and what makes him different from the genetic misfits that are his villains. What makes life valuable is that it doesn't last forever is a sentiment we've heard time and again. But one of the true successes of Amazing Spider-Man 2 is that it's legitimately somewhat explored within the characters and the film's plot points, 
as muddled as they may be. Even before Peter distraughtly says that he can't do the whole Spider-Man thing without Gwen, we as an audience appreciate how precious Gwen is to Peter, specifically when he commits to following Gwen to England or wherever she may go. Even though Peter couldn't save Gwen, or to put it another way, stop time, as is blatantly represented in the admittedly cool image of Spider-Man keeping the gears of the clock tower from turning in the fight against Goblin, he did cherish their relatively brief time together, and uses her example to continue persevering and preserving the sanctity of life. Harry serves as a solid juxtaposition to the fleetingness of time, and how that makes every moment valuable because he knows he's running out of time, and that's exactly why he comes to not care about anyone's life but his own. The real shame is that this wonderful wrinkle doesn't quite work because Harry actually should have plenty of time as I pointed out earlier. It is good that Harry lives because he's fated to be a monster until the end of his days at this point, while Gwen died before her time but made her final days count. I'm not sure if the hope theme works quite as well because the critique the film is putting upon Spider-Man that he may be perpetuating a false hope doesn't work because of the villains. Since they both have contrived setups, neither villain has a legitimate grievance against Spider-Man. I get that they're playing with the classic trope of Spider-Man having the best intentions, yet making mistakes as anyone would, which is pretty tricky to do without making Spider-Man look unlikable or idiotic, but both villains are ultimately too one note to support that kind of nuance. The first movie handled this better by giving Peter a direct hand in creating the lizard, but he's not thrown under the bus because he couldn't have possibly known such a mutation would happen, and probably would have never considered human trials in that early stage. The Hope theme is much more solid in relation to Spider-Man saving civilians due to the scenes such as the montage of Spider-Man running around saving people after Gwen broke up with him, and when he keeps bystanders from touching the metal railing in Times Square. The time the movie sets aside for these and other moments of Spider-Man simply being Spider-Man are essential if we're to pie the public rallying behind him in the final scene. The sequence that really gets me is when Spider-Man saves a small boy from bullies and takes the time to both fix his school project and walk him home. I really like this, not because the boy comes back at the very end, but because it's genuinely a very sweet thing to do. This also serves as a wonderful progression to the scene in the first film where he saves the boy on the bridge and tells him that the mask makes you strong. All this talk about hope pays off in the final scene, and I don't care how silly, contrived, or cheesy it may be. I love the ending of this film. Lady, how could you let your kid run off in the middle of a supervillain attack? What would have happened if Spider-Man hadn't decided to come out of retirement that day? Why is Rhino wearing a mech suit that everyone thinks is silly even though he's mechanical in the Ultimate Comics? I don't care. The ending is a perfect encapsulation of everything I love about Spider-Man and superheroes in general. He overcomes his personal problems and always shows up in the nick of time, clad in a fantastically colorful costume to save the day. He perseveres and teaches us that anyone can be a hero, even that nerdy, quiet kid studying in the corner. Okay, I'll try not to be so savvy as I continue with this review. I just wanted to illustrate that this film, if nothing else, succeeded in speaking to me on a personal level which is something I honestly can't say too often about any Spider-Man film. Now, I know there's at least a significant amount of people who are of the opinion that would have been much more impactful to end the movie quickly after Gwen dies, perhaps right after the scene of her funeral, or Peter visiting her grave through the seasons. Though I definitely can see where these viewers are coming from, I strongly disagree that this would be the right ending for the story on account of the hope through line. That needed a resolution, and the one we were given offers viewers an effective closure and speaks to the core of who Spider-Man is. The ending examines the notion of people finding hope in Spider-Man by asking the logical question of where does he get his hope from? The hope needed to be the hero and save lives. The answer? Gwen Stacy. It's important that we see Peter take Gwen's example to heart and don the costume once again in this specific film. Perhaps the wrap-up is too neat, but I feel that the sentiment is spot on. I will admit that it is a shame and total bonehead move on Sony's part. The very final, spectacular shot of the film was spoiled in trailers and TV spots. That's just inexcusable. Since we're at the film's finale, I suppose I should more directly address Rhino's role in this film, especially in light of him being prominent in some of the film's advertising. I have no problem with either how he's utilized or how much screen time he gets. He has no plot aside from being linked to the gratuitous Sinister Six setup, and his role is indicative of the trope from the comics where Spider-Man randomly encounters low-level villains on patrol, and they usually don't end up being a major part of the story, only being there for a quick action sequence. Shocker in the Ultimate Comics is a prime example of this. 
It's a good excuse to have Spider-Man doing what he does best, and it's important to see this due to the setup and payoff of Spider-Man's interactions with the citizens of New York. As for Paul Giamatti's performance, I'll give critics that he is extremely over-the-top and goofy, even for the material in this film, but I'd be lying if I said it bothers me personally. Especially for a minor villain or a glorified cameo that needs no development, I think a Spider-Man villain can afford to be really goofy, since it gives Spider-Man the opportunity to crack jokes at their expense and knock their inflated egos down a peg. This does lead to one popular criticism that I should address before wrapping up the story analysis and moving on to other details. The film's tone. Many have said that the tone is all over the place, being dark, serious, and dramatic in some scenes, and reaching Batman Forever levels of silly in others, especially with Max Dillon's obsessive behavior before turning into Electro. This is another place where I have to concede to the criticism to a certain degree. I find it pretty steady for the most part, but then things get woefully inconsistent with exaggerated bits, such as Rhino himself, the ridiculous number of police cars in the opening Spidey sequence, and worst of all for me, the cartoonish bordering on Nazi portrayal of Dr. Kafka at Ravencroft where he gleefully tortures Electro. To make it worse, they made Kafka absolutely nothing like how she is in the comics, which makes the pretty cool reference completely without merit. I do think it's important to keep in mind that getting the tone of Spider-Man correct is deceptively difficult. When Spider-Man is at his best and he's not being put in a subversively dark story, there must be a pretty even balance of realistic human interaction, both romantic and otherwise, and high-octane superhero fun. It's difficult to sandwich the mundane and ordinary together and keep both consistent. This doesn't mean The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is excused for its inconsistency, but it's interesting that despite how difficult this is to convey, it's been done very well throughout various comics and cartoons. Even the Raimi films, as much as they irk a lot of my sensibilities in regards to Spider-Man's characterization, have a pretty good grasp on tone that holds through all three films. The various plot threads The Amazing Spider-Man 2 juggles certainly don't help. Since that's all I have to discuss in terms of story, let's move on to visuals, since I've already gone over the performances. This film is easily one of the best-looking superhero films of all time. Of course, looks aren't everything, but I still have to give it big props for its superb color palette and visual effects. We've moved far away from the muted grays that dominated the previous movie, and upgraded to warm hues that remind me very much of modern comic art without looking extremely stylized like Sin City or even parts of Watchmen. I'm particularly reminded of some of the earlier Ultimate Spider-Man issues, such as the first arc that features Dr. Octopus as the main antagonist. In places, I'm tempted to pause shot after shot just to admire how vibrant everything looks. The visual effects work is almost seamless throughout, at least to my eyes. There are sequences when Spidey is swinging where I think it has to be a CGI double, but it never looks fake. Even though I've seen Spider-Man swing around in four other movies, and it shouldn't be a selling point anymore, his jumping around the city swinging from line to line has never been this breathtaking. My favorites are the very first sequence where he's dropping straight down into the heart of the city, and just before the final fight with Electro, where Spidey is chasing him as a stream of light. There's something very magical and dreamlike about how that's visualized that gets to me every time. And I love the touch of Spider-Man climbing his web line to gain altitude, just like you do in the Ultimate Spider-Man and Web of Shadows video games. Speaking of breathtaking, how about that Times Square sequence? Not only is the photography excellent throughout, but how the spider sense was visually represented by showing us every person in immediate danger is just inspired. Almost like an upgrade to that spider sense scene in the first Raimi film where time slows down before and during the fight with Flash. It's set up magnificently, too, because multiple people are shown in different positions as they are seconds away from being either electrified or crushed, and Spider-Man's down a web shooter, yet he still manages to get everyone in time. The shift into first-person POV as the police car comes tumbling forward is really cool and makes the audience feel they are right with Spider-Man. Plus, what's not to love about Spider-Man wearing a fireman's hat? The fight in the power grid is similarly stylish and peppers slow-mo throughout without seeming gimmicky, almost as if to savor the shots that border on Iconic. Perhaps it's also a good technique to use for Spider-Man in general, since he zips around very quickly, but is always dodging or bouncing off something in those brief seconds. Despite it being pretty short, I do like the frantic energy of the Goblin fight in the Clock Tower, as Spider-Man and Harry knock each other around in an almost dance-like fluidity before getting up and close and personal on the Clock Gears. I did briefly mention the opening sequence of Spider-Man chasing Alexei Sitsevich, and besides the ridiculous amount of police and Spider-Man letting the truck crash into a bunch of cars where people must have died, 
I was still grinning ear to ear because the sequence is swashbuckling in its lightheartedness, and they brought back the Spidey Cannonball! I am coining that right now. The other big visual change from The Amazing Spider-Man is the costume itself. I know I talked about it briefly in the last review, but I want to gush about it some more. Anytime the suit is in frame, I'm in absolute awe. Even though it's pretty similar to the Raimi suit, the costume designers added a few subtle touches that add so much to the design. First, they made the webbing on the suit a glossy black instead of silver, and it looks so much better. I believe that for the Raimi suits, the webbing had to be silver to properly photograph the red elements, but I'm glad technology has improved so that's no longer necessary, because the silver web always looked off to me. Maybe I'm just being nitpicky. The other change for the suits, and the most noticeable, is the big white comic book eyes on the mask. I feel it adds so much more to the mask's expression even though the eyes can't move, like in Holland's suit. And I love that the pearly white was augmented using visual effects so that there's always a reflection in the eyes. Probably my favorite shot in the film is the close-up on the eyes in the scene I mentioned earlier when he's reminded of Captain Stacy before getting rushed by Electro. Garfield's build in the suit is extremely similar to Ultimate, and that wins big points with me since my single favorite visual representation of the wall crawler is Mark Bagley's. The last thing I'll mention before wrapping up is Hans Zimmer's score, which I don't think has been well received. I myself am very indifferent on the whole to the soundtrack. I appreciate that it's overall more lively than Horner's score in the first film, but there's only a few tracks that really stand out to me. As someone who has no interest in dubstep, I'm surprised I didn't mind Electro's theme. An electronic sound is certainly appropriate for his character, and I appreciated how Zimmer tried something different than the Dark Knight sound he's so often associated with by including the voices in Electro's two-dimensionally crazy head in his theme. The Goblin theme isn't particularly memorable, but I do find it unnerving when I hear it with the movie. Spider-Man's theme had to grow on me because it reminded me of sporting event music, and while I much prefer the melody Horner came up with, I still do like this new one. I absolutely love the track, You're That Spider Guy. The build-up as it crescendos into the Spider-Man theme is lovely, and it gives me goosebumps listening to it on its own, and with Gwen's speech as Spidey goes back into action. I appreciate that the Spider-Man fanfare can be heard throughout the movie rather than being relegated to the end credits, which I've noticed more and more in superhero films. Bringing this long overdue review to a close, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is very flawed, as I've pointed out at length throughout this video, and I completely understand why many don't like it, but I can't get enough of Peter and Gwen in this film. The acting is top-notch, and the gorgeous visuals are certainly nothing to sneeze at. Even more so than The Amazing Spider-Man, I turn into a little kid when I see Spider-Man throw his trademark quips in his glorious new suit. Calling Electro Sparkles is pure gold. I feel Mark Webb's affection for the character on screen. As for the story, it's still a huge mess, yet in my analysis I was able to find some character progression and thematic material that genuinely worked. I just wish it weren't buried under superfluous fluff. Strangely, it feels as if this movie took the strengths and weaknesses of the prior film and put both on steroids, since the plot is even messier, yet Spider-Man's portrayal is even more outstanding. I give The Amazing Spider-Man 2 a 3.5 out of 5 because I do have to take into account the movie's faults, but that score isn't indicative of the pure joy I get out of watching it. If you hate this movie, I doubt I've changed your mind, but hopefully I've provided a different perspective and pointed out elements in the story you maybe hadn't considered before. It's a shame that this series of films had such a short time in the sun, but I'm of course beyond excited that Spider-Man has joined the ranks of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and from what I've seen so far, Tom Holland is just absolutely terrific. Both Spider-Man film series are heavily flawed in my eyes, so I hope Spider-Man Homecoming takes the opportunity to improve on what's come before and deliver the best adaptation of the Web Slinger for the big screen. I'll be returning to Batman animated series reviews after this, but I'm still very keen on reviewing more Spider-Man media. Hint hint, 90 series and Spectacular Spider-Man. So let me know if that's something you guys would be interested in. Thanks again everyone for tolerating my abysmal laziness in getting more content out, and especially for keeping the subscriber count up in my year and a half long absence. You guys are the best, so until next time, take care and keep spinning webs.